Good afternoon. My name is Raymond Knopp, and I'd like to give you an account of Open Air Interfaces Open Software in 5G Radio Access Network, Core Network, and Mosaic 5G. Now, originally, I was supposed to give this talk with um, my colleague Doug Nicely from Qualcomm, but under the current um, pandemic situation, uh, that was extremely difficult to uh, organize. So we decided that I would give this on behalf of both of us. So who am I? Uh, I'm a professor in communication systems at an institute called Euricom, uh, which is in the south of France, actually in the heart of the French Riviera. Um, at the same time, I'm also the president of the Open Air Interface Software Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization um, which tries to promote the uh, open air interface software packages. And my main area of work today is in the radio access network component of uh, modern cellular systems. So be, before I uh, continue here, I'd like to first thank our sponsor and a strong OAI supporter, Qualcomm, uh, and in particular, uh, Doug Nicely, who uh, normally would have been my uh, co-presenter. So what is Open Air Interface um, and who are some of its friends? In, in, in this type of uh, software environment? Well, it's become feasible today to put a compliant uh, 4G or 5G base station, what are known as ENOBs or GNOBs, um, and the telecommunication network functions of the core network, or the 4G and 5G, in a commodity x86 box or cloud infrastructure for that matter. And even some major vendors today uh, start to adopt this approach to some extent. Now, there are different types of software out there today um, that can do this. Some are closed and some are open. Um, you have a, a piece of software from Amarisoft, which is a, a, a very, very solid piece uh, of software, a commercial software, closed source, which provides 4G, 5G, RAN, and core network solutions. You have Open Air Interface, uh, which is open source code and also provides 4G, 5G, RAN, uh, and 4G, 5G core network. Um, and adopts what I would call a 3GPP friendly licensing policy. You also have software that's coming out of the ORAN open source community, uh, which is part, partially open source uh, radio access network components, um, and also adopts uh, what I would call a 3GPP friendly licensing policy. And then you have, uh, strictly speaking, open source uh, projects like SRS LTE and what is coming SRS RAN, uh, which is 4G, 5G RAN. You have the OMEC project, uh, which is a 4G EPC. The MAGMA uh, project or the MAGMA Foundation, which is provides a 4G EPC and a now also 5G core network components. The free 5GC, which is um, a 5G core network solution. And Open 5GS, uh, which is both 4G and 5G. Now, because of all this software that's coming out, there is the emergence of what you can call radio hackers, and development and user communities that are experimenting with 3GPP software implementations. And Open Air Interface is one of those, both the, the, the software and the community. Now, a bit about the Open Air Interface Software Alliance itself. Um, it was founded in 2014 as what is known as a fond de dotation, and the English equivalent is an endowment fund. So this, um, this fund really has the objective of maintaining and extending the open air interface software packages that were initially developed by Euricom and actually donated to the fund. They donated, Euricom donated the software to the fund. Um, now today, there, we're actually looking and we, we, we have a lot of strategic partners from the 3GPP ecosystem that are either users or contributors to, this, uh, to these software packages. Um, and we're actually looking to them to, to help us um, improve and make the software usable for the 3GPP ecosystem itself, so that it could serve as a reference software implementation for the ecosystem. Now, today we also have many associate members, both from industry and academia. Um, and often these are partners in collaborative projects in various framework programs, whether they be academic or industrial. Now, since it is a, uh, an endowment fund, uh, we do accept donations, and these are used to maintain an engineering support team. Therefore, uh, CICD, 
community management and building, project management, uh, and industry relations to a certain extent. Today, these are the, the strategic members in 2021. Um, so you can see it ranges from operators like Orange um, to uh, equipment vendors uh, like Fujitsu or semiconductor um, vendors like Qualcomm or Sequence or Xilinx, um, and also uh, intellectual property uh, and, and, and research uh, companies like Interdigital. Um, and also, um, institutional partners like the, the Power Project Office, uh, which uh, manages a lot of innovative research projects and research platforms in the United States. So today, what is Open Interface? Open Interface is open source code cloud native telco software. So I'm just gonna show it here with a, with a picture. Um, a telecommunications network today, or what it will become, uh, is going to be uh, an interconnection of many clouds running a lot of software. Um, you know, and it's really disaggregated into, into three pieces. Uh, one which you can call really the, 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 the control plane, which, which uh, houses the, the core network and even some of the RAN control network uh, control plane protocols. Um, and that's interconnected with um, something that is responsible for the the radio access network uh, and also edge networks which are, are clouds that are deployed close to the radio infrastructure for new services that require things like low latency or for um, storing content closer to the to the users and finally you would also have other clouds which which house controllers which are managing the different uh, software pieces that are running in in the various uh, various clouds in the infrastructure so you know Open Air Interface today are all of these blocks that you see on the top, top left, the AMF, the SMF. Uh, th these are the different um, software elements that constitute the, the core network or the control plane of the core network. Um, and also one on the bottom left here, which is one that would is actually part of the what we would call today the base station, which could be um, today very, very far away from the actual radio equipment itself. Uh, and these are deployed with tools like Kubernetes uh, and packaged in, in, in Helm charts, for instance. So today, open air interface is really like that. And also what's coming now is closer to the, to the edge, you might have pieces of the, the, the core network, like the user plane function, um, or the, the user plane um, of, the, uh, of the base station, both in the, the upper part of the protocol stack and the lower part of the protocol stack and the, the physical layer, what is called the, the DU. Um, in terms of the controller, you would have a piece of controllers that would influence the, uh, the core network uh, and a, an agent that would actually be running in the core network cloud. And similarly, a piece that would be handling the, the radio access network and controllers that are that are installed or deployed in the, um, the radio cloud or the edge cloud near the radio. Now, the, these, these elements that are, that, are, that are reflected by the controllers um, are essentially what uh, are produced by uh, communities like the, the, the ORAN or the Open Radio Access Network community, uh, where, they, where they come up with the term like the RAN Intelligent Controller or the RIC. Uh, that's what we have here. So all of these different the, the different pieces, you have to look at them like apps that are deployed in uh, a cloud infrastructure today. And an open air interface packages its software today in, in that kind of a framework. Other frameworks as well, but that, that is one of the target frameworks today. So what, what do we manage today? Essentially, there are different project groups that are inside the community. Um, and basically, those can be divided divided into two pieces. One one piece that uses the the OAI, the OAI public license, and another piece that uses the classical three clause BSD license. For the OAI public license components, that that includes the four G and five G radio access network. So by that we mean the the E node Bs, the G node Bs, the UEs, um, which run the layer one and layer two network functions, and also RF modeling when when you put simulation into um, some of the systems. Uh, there's the 5G core network components, uh, which follow the 3GPP service-based architecture network functions. And finally, the Mosaic 5G, which are the controller functions. 
um, so and and also um, have some um, forms of orchestration and management in, in, in inside that project. So these three projects they represent basically the three clouds that I, I described in in the previous slides. Um, now for the for the BSD components. Uh, we do still maintain the release 16 uh, mobility management entity, uh, which is the uh, one of the, contr uh, the, the control plane functions of the 4G core network and also the 5G non-standalone um, core network. And this is now a part of the Magma Foundation project. Uh, so this is, this is managed uh, jointly with the, um, the partners inside of the Magma Foundation and in particular Facebook connectivity. Uh, OAI is also today managing a CICD pipeline. Uh, so it's a very classical CICD pipeline. With uh, we, we have a Git repository, which is at Eurocom. Uh, there are also some components, in particular the, the 4G core network components that are housed for historical reasons on um, a public GitHub repository. Um, but, but basically from these two repositories, uh, when people in, in, in the various communities push code to, uh, to the repository that triggers um, various uh, pipeline stages that are running today uh, primarily at the, at the Eurocom infrastructure um, and, and actually test the different pieces of code. You know, when it, when it comes to testing telecommunication um, software and in particular the, um, the, the radio access network components, where you're running radio software, which is operating devices uh, which have very random behavior. Um, that's extremely difficult and, and a challenging task for, for CICD. And we're actually looking for um, new methods to explore the, 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 uh, the different ways at making this more robust. So if I go into a little bit more detail now of the RAN project group, um, the RAM project group on the left, you can see the, the, the sponsors here uh, and some of the, the, the contributors. These are the, some of the big contributors you see on the right. Uh, you can see, so if, if, if you know the institutes, you can see that it's a mix between um, industry and um, fairly high profile research centers. Now, the, the RAN software from OEI has, can be deployed in different ways. Um, and I won't go into all the details here, but uh, you can see here the these were the different phases of development that we had leading up to the uh, the beginning of this year, when the the the, the basic the three phases of, uh, of of the basic development of 5G were finished. Um, so basically, on the left hand side, you have the the, the so called non standalone 5G, which requires actually the 4G um, network to be deployed alongside the the 5G network. And so you have the 4G and 5G base stations that are talking and the terminal switches between the two technologies as a function of um, when it is uh, in coverage of the, the 5G cells. Um, but it doesn't completely switch. It actually stays connected in the control plane perpetually to the 4G side. Uh, and, and it just uses the, the 5G for the user plane connection. Um, so in open air interface today, you can deploy a, uh, this, this hybrid um, or non-standalone mode of 5G. Uh, and much more recently, and later I will show you a demo, um, we can deploy the full 5G uh, solution, which uses the 5G core network and the full 5G RAN for both the user plane and the control plane. And so today, uh, open air interface can operate in these different modes. Um, we can support different platforms, uh, and I'm giving here a list of some of the, the, the radio units that, we, uh, that we're using currently. Uh, of course, we can support the, the, the National Instruments uh, USRP, so the Universal Software Radio Peripherals, all of them. Um, the, the, the different features of the, the, uh, the air interface can be exploited differently on the different platforms because some of them are more sophisticated than others. Uh, but these can be used both for the 4G and 5G components. And more recently, we're supporting some more commercial uh, radio units, uh, one from an Irish company called Benetel, um, which provides actually something uh, very interesting from the, the community perspective. Uh, it implements um, one version of the ORAN 7.2 frontal, which I'll describe a little bit later. Um, and we're also working with another radio unit from uh, a company in France called AW2S, 
uh, which is functional both for um, LTE and 5G new radio. And this uses an eCPRI um, front hall interface, which is, is, which is a little bit different, but similar in spirit to the, to, to the ORAN. Um, and here we've listed some of the UEs that we've tested with, the, with our software. Some of them are tested only in uh, so-called non-standalone or the hybrid mode, and others have been tested both in standalone and non-standalone. So the, what, what do we support in open air interface, both in 4G and 5G? Um, so you, you saw in that, the, the, the big picture I showed, the, the different clouds. Um, basically here you can see two of those clouds uh, from the radio access network. On the top you have the uh, so-called central unit. Uh, so that was the, um, the, the, the unit that was split actually between the, uh, the core network cloud and the radio cloud. Um, and th that split actually connects to a, uh, another um, network element called the distributed unit, um, which uh, implements the, the layer two proto protocol stack of 4G and 5G. So between, between those two elements, you have an, in an interface that is uh, specified by the 3GPP called the F1 interface. That is something now today that is, is standard in um, the open interface 5G solution. We have a version of it for 4G, but it doesn't really uh, have the same impact as the, the 5G version, which is something that is today there are commercial um, uh, components available that, that we can interoperate with. So we do implement that F1 interface, both the control uh, plane and the user plane of that. This is actually a new implementation that was brought into the, the software this year. Uh, and we're doing interoperability testing with uh, a commercial solution from a European vendor called Accelerant to test the open interface DU against the uh, Accelerant CU. So that, that is one of the interests of impl implementing a, an interface like this. We can mix and match and take pieces from open interface and mix it with a piece from another software vendor or hardware vendor. Um, a little bit lower down between the within the what what the 3GPP calls the DU, there's an interface that is um, specified by the small cell forum uh, called the um, the FAPI interface or the NFAPI interface. Both both of them exist. Whether it's networked, uh, if it's networked, it's NFAPI. If it's within a data center or in um, um, bet between two chips on a system on chip, it would be the FAPI interface. Um, the, the open air interface implementation of Phi and Mac, they implement the, the small cell form FAPI. So today, all the, the layer one procedures that we have are compliant with the small cell form specification, uh, both for 4G and for 5G, for that matter. So here too, we can interoperate with different software vendors at the level of the, um, uh, within, the within the DU. And finally, if we go down a little bit lower, uh, the frontal interface, that which interfaces the actual radio equipment with the, um, with the DU or the physical layer of the DU. Um, there are different solutions. Um, one that which I already mentioned, the, the ORN 7.2 user plane solution, was, this is something that was done with, the, with an Irish company, Benetel. Um, and we are actually now planning to do interoperability testing with other um, remote radio unit vendors, and it's, it's going on right now. Uh, we've just received a few of the, uh, the radio units in our lab. Um, and this is going on with um, collaboration with one of our partners, Xilinx, using one of their new, um, one of their new uh, accelerator call, cards called T1, uh, which you'll see a, a bit more in a minute. So all of these areas, these different interfaces are a very important part of open air interface because it allows, allows us to interface with other partners. So if I can just quickly go over the roadmap for the rest of this year, um, we're in the process of stabilizing the, uh, the interconnection procedures between the 4G and 5G uh, for the so-called non-standalone or hybrid mode. Uh, we're bringing in support for MIMO now in, the, in 5G, both for uh, non-standalone and standalone, up to 4x4 MIMO if the hardware supports it. And we're in the process now of improving our throughput. Um, so our targets today are are anywhere from uh, 100 to 400 megabit per second downlink um, if we are using a uh, 40, 40 megahertz channel and 200 to 800 mega, megabits per second downlink from a, for a 100 megahertz channel if we, if we use a high-end RRU. 
So the, the targets really are going to depend on the type of radio equipment you're going to connect to, to our software. Um, those are downlink throughputs, and we're much more modest on the uplink for the moment, um, only targeting 30 or, or 60 megabit per second on the uplink. Um, we're in the process of improving our link adaptation um, to, to take into account feedback from the, from the terminals, and this will actually help us get to these targets. Um, we are working on the basic frequency range to interoperability, so those are, that's the, the millimeter wave frequencies, or the very high frequencies up at 26 gigahertz in the United States, or, or even higher than that, uh, including some of the, the beamforming procedures. Uh, and this is using some um, experimental hardware from our partner Interdigital. Uh, they have a millimeter wave radio unit that um, that we're working on for uh, that we're working with to to interface and test to AI with commercial with commercial terminals. Um, we're now adding support for flexible bandwidth and additional subcarrier spacings. This is in particular to support the the low latency scenarios of uh, of five G. Uh, so in particular, we're looking at one additional dedicated bandwidth part for the, the low latency. And this is in a standalone mode. Um, we have partners that are introducing the SDAP support. So that, that is the, the protocol layer to support um, uh, quality of service control. Um, and as I mentioned, also the, the F1 integration with a commercial uh, CU solution from Acceleron, the European software vendor. If we look at what's going on for next year, um, Essentially, we are now integrating um, TTCN3 interfaces in the EDMB and the GNOMB. This is to allow the, um, an all software conformance testing of the a UE protocol stack. So if a UE protocol vendor wants to use um, open air interface to test uh, their, the, the conformance of their protocols, uh, th they can do that. And this is a new project that we started with the, the French uh, uh, chipset vendor sequence and a startup in, uh, in France called Firecell. Um, we are also in, going to introduce the uh, so-called E1AP, so that uh, that allows the separation of the control and user plane in the in the radio access network. So basically, in that first picture that I showed of the the, the three clouds, there was one radio access component that was in the, um, the the core network cloud, and this E1 interface is what allows that to happen. Um, we are starting to introduce support for localization coming from the release 16 specifications of the 3GPP. Um, and more specific to the standalone mode, uh, we're looking at supporting frequency range two, so the very high frequencies. Uh, the handover procedures will be integrated next year and some early uh, contributions for uh, support of uh, non-terrestrial networks. This is coming in some of our European projects with some of the members of the OEI community that are involved both in developing OEI and also um, pushing contributions to the 3GPP standard in this area. Um, we are going to enhance the support for the ORAN 7.2 uh, frontal, in particular by introducing the, the control plane in addition to the user plane and starting to use the, this T1 card from Xilinx with uh, commercial radio units. Um, we will also introduce, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the context of Mosaic 5G, support for the, uh, the ORAN controller interfaces, so the, the, the E2 interface and the O1 interface. And in particular, adding the, the necessary RAN agents inside the, uh, the OAI um, 3GPP component so that um, we, we can um, uh, allow the, the, the controllers to influence the behavior of the radio access network. Um, so th this, this corresponds to the third cloud that I described at the very beginning uh, of the, the controllers that are influencing potentially both the core network and the radio access network. In this case, it's the radio access network. Um, a little bit more on this T1 card, because um, in addition to being a um, providing support or interfacing for the radio units coming from the ORAN community, um, it actually also will provide us uh, accelerator services that we can um, improve the, uh, the, the computational efficiency of the, uh, the implementation by offloading some of the, the very, very heavy um, signal processing, in particular the, the, the forward error correction, off of the uh, generic cloud compute um, resources and putting it onto um, 
PCI Express cards that are plugged into the, um, the nodes. So basically we will offload some of the, the, um, the, 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 the channel decoding uh, procedures. And you know this, this is a project that we're working on very, very closely with Xilinx uh, and some other partners um, that, 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 that work with Xilinx, uh, an Indian company called VVDN, uh, which is providing some of the basic uh, DBDK-based drivers to allow this, um, this offload. Um, so basically this LDBC um, channel decoding will be integrated into the uh, OEI Genome B. In fact, it already is integrated and we're, we are now doing um, testing with end-to-end uh, -end with, with, with real UEs. Um, and a little bit later, we will look at the, the uh, lower L1 offload from the, um, from, for the ORAN 7.2 um, in, in, using the same card. Okay, if now I switch to the uh, 5G core network project group. So here the, the objective is to develop a fully 3GPP um, compatible 5G core network stack, standalone uh, as open source software for the OEI community. Uh, and here the license, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, is the, um, the OEI public license uh, version 1.1. Uh, contributions are open to anyone who signs the license agreement. That, that, that is our policy. And today we have contributions coming from all over the place. Um, and we have, a, we have some, and, and we're very grateful to our sponsors, Qualcomm, uh, Facebook Connectivity and Interdigital, uh, that, are, that are providing the, the funds to allow this, uh, this project to, uh, to advance at the speed that it is advancing. Um, today, there, there are several uh, contributors. You can see some academic uh, contributors like Eurocom, uh, Beijing University of Post and Telecommunication. Um, other contributors uh, from the community, there are too many for me to mention. Uh, I'm just listing some, some of the big ones here. Um, now, if I look at the, the, the status of this project, basically what we, we set up to, uh, to as an objective from the beginning was to get a, a solid and functional 5G core. So the basic procedures to allow multiple uh, terminals, multiple UEs, with multiple PDU sessions, um, the connection and registration procedures, and the session management procedures. And then maybe some additional features um, like network function registration, network function discovery. So to be able to um, discover and select the, the right SMF or UPF, um, some of the um, core network handover procedures, core network paging, um, and, and a, few other, uh, a few other procedures. Um, and, and basically, there are, there are different flavors when, when it comes to deploying the, um, the, the basic five, uh, 5G core. The most minimal flavor is just the, um, the four um, basic nodes, the, the AMF, the SMF, the NRF, and the UPF. That's enough to, to sustain a communication with a commercial UE. Um, but then you can add um, other, uh, other elements, which are there for... Um, uh, authentication and a uh, the, some some of the more advanced database uh, um, elements, um, which, which which you don't actually uh, need to, to to sustain communication, but in a, in a, in a large scale network are required. Now, with respect to the user plane, now the the user plane function is something that is not always deployed as software. In fact, in in, in a large network, it is not definitely not uh, only software. It is heavily software controlled. Um, but it is definitely a hardware element because of the, the amount of traffic that has to flow through it. Uh, and we have different flavors. We have, we have a, a software flavor that we inherited from the, the 4G core network, which has additional fe features for 5G. Um, we can use uh, the, the uh, VPP UPF, which relies on the VPP implementation from Travelping, which is an open source implementation, which has DPDK support. Uh, so those two are actually software solutions. Uh, but we're also working with a production grade UPF from a, a Canadian company called Kaloom, um, which is a uh, which is a, a UPF that runs on 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 P4 fabric, and can switch uh, extremely high high throughputs. So today we're, we're trying to operate with with, with different solutions uh, so that we can inter interconnect with um, potentially uh, uh, commercially viable solutions as well. Um, now, in terms of the validation. We do our CI/CD with a professional tester, uh, so we use a uh, commercial piece of software 
uh, from developing solutions called DS Tester. Uh, this is to test the EMF, SMF, and UPF with simulated uh, radio access network components. Um, we also do uh, drag and test for uh, EMF, SMF. So we test uh, the EMF, SMS with simulated um, core network components. So simulated SMF, UPF, and of course also the RAN components. So that's isolating um, um, partic particular elements in the core network. Uh, of course, we do over the air testing too. And we use the, now we use the OEI G node B and even the o open air interface uh, user equipment and commercial, commercial um, and modems like from Quectel or Simcom uh, to test the core network. We also use commercial GenoBs, so Amarisoft, Bicel GenoBs, uh, our partners in China are using Bicel. Uh, at Eurocom, we also use Amarisoft now. Um, and we use there, of course, we also use uh, commercial off-the-shelf UVs. Um, we use uh, open source RAN simulators, things like Genode BSIM and UE RANSIM also in, in our testing. So we, we have a variety of different tools that we use to, to get as much uh, different types of stimulus as possible to make the software as, um, uh, as, as robust as possible. And all of this is integrated into the, the, the testing procedures with our CICD chain. Um, now, in terms of deployment, both for CICD and for uh, um, even production deployment, the um, traditional or classic deployment uh, is, is done uh, on uh, bare metal servers or virtual machines. Uh, we have ways to do that uh, with all of our software components. Uh, we have also um, automated deployment of the network functions in Docker containers that are using Docker Compose. And one of the one of the demos I'll do later will actually be using that pre-deployed, but we'll be using that. Uh, and then we also have a fully cloud native deployment like the one I described at the beginning, um, which uses Helm charts uh, on, on the OpenShift cluster that we have in, uh, in Sofia Antipodes. And, and I'll do a very quick um, video demo of, of deploying it on, on a cluster. Uh, here you have the timeline, which you can see this, this was a very ambitious project. And the, there, was, uh, there was virtually no software at the beginning. And today, already in the middle of the project, we have a fully functional 5G core that has been deployed in several uh, labs across the world um, and successfully deployed and used with various genome bees. So th this was actually uh, very ambitious and, and very successful to this point. Um, if I just jump to uh, more or less where we are today, um, you know, we are now starting to test uh, the, the, the core network with production grade commercial UPF solutions. Um, we are integrating already the, the, uh, the, the network slicing functions from 3GPP. Um, and we are also considering um, uh, different um, event exposure uh, procedures for all of the, 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 the components that we have. Uh, where we're going towards the end of the project, which should be uh, in March or maybe a little bit after March next year, um, we will also already have uh, classification services, um, redundant transmission for uh, ultra-reliable low latency communications, and also um, more, uh, much more mobility support than we have today. Okay, if I now go quickly over the, the, the third project before we go into the, the demonstrations. Um, Mosaic 5G is the newest edition, uh, and you'll see in a minute, uh, it, it was actually its own project up until um, the, the, the middle of this year. Uh, and the objective hasn't changed. We just brought it into Open Air Interface because typically Mosaic 5G was used with Open Air Interface. Uh, but the objectives are a little bit different and, and very much related to the, the, the original cloud uh, picture I showed at the beginning. Um, they were to provide an ecosystem of open source 4G and 5G service platforms, reusable components and use cases. And at the same time to provide an SDK to be able to architect and compose your custom 4G, 5G network service delivery platforms that are tailored to the use case. Right, so it's a little bit different than, than developing the uh, the core components of a 3GPP network. This is really at the um, at the periphery of the 3GPP network, but necessary to, 
to actually deploy a, a real network. So inside of Mosaic 5G, when you combine it with Open Interface, there are really three platforms. Um, there's one now that is called uh, Triromatics, uh, which is all about orchestration and management. Um, there are now AI operators. Uh, there are elements of resource control, monitoring, uh, everything related to deploying uh, on Kubernetes. Um, the notion of um, image uh, storage uh, is there and blueprints for deploying uh, in your own environment. That's, that's what's in Triomatics. Uh, there's also the FlexRIC, uh, which is basically the RAN Intelligent Controller, um, which will use the, um, which is already actually starting to use the, uh, the ORAN E2 interface. Uh, and it, it is there to, to provide a, an example of a real-time controller. Um, and also the RAN agent, which is the piece of software that's running in the proximity of the, uh, the G node B, so the, the CU component of the G node B and the DU component of the G node B, so that the, the, the controller can actually influence uh, the, uh, the behavior of the protocols in the radio access network. And there's another new piece of software called FlexCN, um, which is the equivalent, but now acting on the edge network and the core network components. So if I just look at the highlights the, um, that, are, that are coming, there will be a flexible uh, RAN Intelligent Controller SDK, the E2 agent, and XApps, so XApps in the, in the, in the ORAN sense. Um, a flexible core network controller and associated XApps, uh, an intelligent RAN and core network operators, and use case driven CICD for the um, uh, this component combined with uh, with Open Air Interface and potentially actually also other uh, RAN platforms. So here you see a little bit of the the, the past and wh where Mosaic Five G came from. It was its own project um, developing. Um, the, the similar components with different names. Uh, some of them have changed names, but the spirit has remained the same. And where it is today now, that it's fully integrated with Open Air Interface, is providing really an agile 5G RAN and core network service platform on top of OAI. And here you have the roadmap, um, which I think you can, uh, you can look at afterwards. Okay, so before I show you a couple of demos, um, just a, just a, a, a brief uh, overview of Yorkcom's infrastructure in Sofionti Police. So um, we have a state of the state of the art computing cl computing cluster, which is running uh, Red Hat OpenShift. Um, this is done in collaboration with Red Hat, uh, and we use it in, in various projects uh, with them. Uh, so it it is a, a server farm with uh, with a switching fabric which is also interconnected with some radio equipment. So you can see an example of, a, of a, a small cell tower that's on the top of our building with, uh, with radio units that are connected to the, the switching fabric so that we can actually do outdoor testing of some of the software components um, that we have. Um, so some of the demo that I'll show you here will be using the, uh, the, the cluster um, to various degrees, um, some of it using actually in, in OpenShift and other pieces of it on bare metal and on um, just on servers as Docker containers. Um, but you know, it, it depends on the type of uh, deployment that we do, but we, we can do a full solution like the one I described uh, in, in, in the first slide um, this afternoon. So if I just now describe the, uh, the first demo. Um, so, what I'm going to show you basically is uh, an end-to-end -end OAI stack um, deployed on, on OpenShift uh, using Helm charts. Um, so you, you can see the, 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 six, the, the seven components that I have here um, are, are a subset of the, the, the components you would have in, in a full-scale 5G network. So you have the AMF, SMF. Uh, I'm even putting in a G node B here and uh, a UE. Uh, which are there to, uh, to uh, in in a, a, as simulated um, 
traffic, but it's actually a full implementation of both the Genovi and the UE uh, that are connected with what we call the RF simulator, um, which allows us to have um, actually test the, the Genovi uh, and UE software running um, in real time on, 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 on whatever computer we like. Um, and this is interconnected with the uh, with the core network and all of it running on the same cluster. So here there's actually no radio equipment, but all of the elements of the radio network are, are actually there and running. Um, and what they are is basically uh, pods inside the OpenShift Kubernetes cluster. And they're interconnected on the fabric of the cluster. Some of them within um, within the, within the nodes, and other um, some of them are operating on different nodes. For instance, the Geno B is definitely not on the same node as any of the core network elements. Okay, so if now I go to the um, short video that my colleague prepared, and I will explain you what's happening in real time. So here he's logged into a machine. You can call you see it's called Iliad. Um, basically, that's the jump host that allows us to uh, instantiate uh, elements in the cluster and also monitor the cluster on, on the command line. So you can see he did a Helm install of the, the OAI NRF, which is one of the elements you saw before. And he's just checking that it's actually deployed on the, the cluster with the, the famous OC commands. So OC get pods gives you the, uh, the it lists the pods that are, that are deployed in the, in the namespace. And so now he's he's just deployed the um, the AMF and check that it's deployed. And now he is deploying the SMF. And you can see a few logs that came back after the after it was deployed. So he'll deploy all of the elements, um, and, and then he will he will as 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 a new element uh, makes a connection with another another one. You will see that he'll he'll um, he'll grab the logs from from the element just to show that it was actually connected. He's still he's still in the process of um, deploying every element. Uh, here he's getting the logs from. The S gateway U or the or the, the equivalent of the UPF, um, just to check that it, it was connected properly to the SMF. So this is what I mentioned before. This is the 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 tiny S gateway U, which is a U, which is basically a UPF, um, and it's a common piece of so uh, code with the with the four G S gateway U. Here he's, he's already deployed the Geno B. And he's checking that the AMF sees that the Geno B is connected. And that's, that's what happened. And now he will install the, the, the UE so that it can, connect to, it can connect to the network completely. So he's listing all of the, um, the pods that were deployed. And now he's checking if the UE is actually registered with the network, and it is. And it is connected, and now he will, he is now um, doing an RSH into the container of the UE. Looking at the network interfaces, he's going to show that the, the UE got uh, an IP address from the network. And now he will just show you that it is actually connected to the internet. He will ping using the ton interface to Google. So we've, we've deployed a full uh, 5G network on a single cluster. Um, of course, the, the, the GNOB and ENODB were simulated, but they were RF simulated. So it's actually a full implementation of the GNOB and the UE. Uh, and we had full connectivity.
Okay, now I'm going to do a little bit more of a risky demo. Um, th this is really a, an end-to-end -end 5G standalone um, demonstration with, with a commercial uh, terminal. Uh, so you can see the terminal here, a picture of it. It's in our lab. I'm saying it's a bit risky because I'm, I'm going to log in live into our, into our network here. Um, so what has been pre-deployed here on this time, not on OpenShift, it's on another server uh, using Docker Compose. Uh, it's essentially the same thing, um, although without the Helm charts. Uh, so we have a, the, the same network that you, you, you saw earlier um, in, the, uh, in the OpenShift deployment. Um, the only difference is that since this is a, a particular machine, it's fairly simple for me to uh, go onto that machine and I've logged onto one of those machines already. Uh, and I've placed Wireshark, uh, I've started Wireshark on the network interface so that we can sniff the traffic between the radio access network and the core network. Um, the terminal that we have here is a, uh, an embedded SimCom module that you see here on the, the motherboard of this uh, mini Linux box. Um, which is actually running a Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon uh, 855 modem. The, um, the G node B itself is, a, is running in one of the servers that you see in this, uh, in this rack here. It's, its name is Mozart. You'll see that the machine that I'm on is Mozart. Uh, and I, here I'm not running the split G node B, I'm running the, the monolithic G node B. And it's connected to this uh, device here, which is one of these national instruments um, um, USRP X3 310 radios. Okay, so that's that's the scenario that we have. So let me go into my uh, virtual machine. So um, here you can, this is the Wireshark uh, window here. Um, this window, you can see uh, I'm on this machine, Mozart. I've already pre-logged in here beforehand. And here I'm just going to invoke the um, the E node B, okay. Um, normally what you should see, uh, let me just run it once and then stop it because uh, the USRP needs to be poked once. Okay, so now I will run it. And normally here in the Wireshark window, you should see the, you see it twice because I ran the genome B once before, you see the NG setup request and response. So the, that means that the genome B is connected to the core network. That's what my colleague Sagar showed you before in the logs of the, the AMF. Uh, and here we're seeing it with, with Wireshark. Um, so what, what, the, what other things do I have here? I, here I have a status window, uh, which is just giving me uh, traces from the genome B that shows me that it's actually running. Uh, and in this window here, um, you can see the name NR module one. Uh, that's the name of this machine. That's the little mini Linux box that had the, the, uh, the SimCom module on it. Um, and what I have here is a little script. Uh, I can show you quickly, uh, which basically um, tells uh, Linux to attach the, um, the module to the network. So these QMI clear is the is the uh, the set of scripts uh, that work with these kind of modules um, to, tr to trigger the connection. So I'm going to try this, and hopefully it will work right off the bat. And it did. Okay, so you can see here in the status in in the UE uh, that it obtained an IP address. Uh, you can see in my status window here that I have all kinds of nice statistics uh, telling me how good the, the radio quality is of the OAI genome B. And here in Wireshark, you can see the full trace of the, uh, the protocol of the, of the attached sequence of the 5G network. So any, any people that are, are uh, um, well-versed in the, the 3GPP uh, and GAP, uh, you will recognize these messages. So here I've completely connected this module and normally I should be able to Ping, and I will actually show you that I'm using the interface one, uh, 150. I should be able to ping, uh, and I am able to ping Linux. And just to show you one other interesting thing, I have here a, uh, a local uh, machine. Which is local to our oops, I'm sorry, wrong wrong IP address. Local to our network, which actually shows you the latency of OEI G node B in this configuration. We're down 
somewhere on the order of uh, seven to 10 milliseconds round trip on a ping, which is not too bad for this configuration of uh, 5G. So I will just go back to conclude here. So in conclusion, all of the OAI components are available today uh, and can be used to build an experimental 5G network like the one I just showed you. Um, today, we animate three project groups, uh, Radio Access Network, 5G Core, and then the new Mosaic 5G uh, uh, group within Open Air Interface. So I'm encouraging everybody to get in touch and to get involved. We have Slack channels, mailing lists, regular online meetings, and biannual workshops too. And I'd also like to thank again our sponsor, uh, NOAI supporter Qualcomm.